Uh, REITs, REITs may be better than dividend stock, kind of if you're looking for uh, income generation because REITs by law uh, have to give back, I think, 90%. It's some huge amount of uh, your other capital back to back to the shareholders. But again, all these also are uh, have, have the risk of the capital uh, gains or losses. Uh, some guys said uh, company as as Intel or Boeing or government uh, preferred uh, that some guy could be me as well. The reason why I still hold Intel and Boeing in my portfolio is uh, kind of a government won't let them fail. Again, it's a very, that's not, generally I don't use this thesis for investment. Uh, so Sam, I don't know if you're referring to me or someone else, but the reason I still hold Boeing uh, is uh, there are only two companies in the world which makes uh, airplanes. Of course, China is now starting to do that as well. Uh, China recently had their first uh, commercial uh, airplane flight. Uh, but again, when it comes to the to the Western world, it's only Boeing and Airbus. So the thesis I'm still holding Boeing uh, is... Come on, it's a, it's a strategic asset for U.S. government um, and will not let it fail. Uh, Intel, kind of a same uh, thesis is what I started with, but with TSMC also putting plants in U.S., that thesis has been a little bit shaken. But after the CEO change on Intel, I'm like, okay, let's give uh, this new guy, Pat Gelsinger, uh, you know, a few years. Uh, minimum five years because the whole capital uh, expenditure plan of setting up a new fab, uh, you know, these things are not easy. When it comes to a semiconductor, uh, our, the, the gestation period and our patience period has to be really, really long. These things uh, move slow. Uh, these things, um, uh, you know, uh, don't expect a quick returns from when it comes to semi. And that's why we'll see semi is, semis are very cyclical business. Uh, sorry, semi stocks are very cyclical. Uh, the business is, I think, is evergreen. We'll always need semis, but the stock uh, of semi generally stays cyclical. When there is a hype, everyone piles into it. And when the companies, you know, uh, let's say start to put a new fab plant, uh, start to do some capital expenditure, that will take a few years to board. To, to bear fruits. And then we'll see, you know, that initial enthusiasm will die down and the stocks will go down. But but I'm still overall bullish on semi. Yeah, so I do hold Intel very small position. And again, my thesis was we need a local player for, you know, for uh, fabrication. But over the last one year, I see TSMC also putting up a plant here. Uh, so we'll see how these two, you know, compete against each other. Also, Intel opening up their own fab plants and become a contract manufacturing, which is very unlike of Intel. Uh, but I like uh, that step because, hey, they are moving towards uh, uh, rather than tied up with their own process or with their own chips. They are also will be working and creating chips for, for other companies as well. Uh, did I miss any questions? Uh, BA, too big to fail, passengers be damned. Uh, unfortunately, that is, yeah, that's true. Uh, same is the case with the banks also, right? Too big to fail. Investors or savers or, or uh, you know, common people be damned. Who cares? Uh, that is why we have to care for, care for ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> uh, how to look for unusual option activity. So I think there are some services who provide this information, Ross. I have not looked at that. Um, I know in whole 2020 or 2021, uh, uh, CNBC used to, uh, there, there used to be uh, some host on CNBC, uh, those brothers, Nigerian brothers. I don't see them now, uh, but during the whole, uh, you know, uh, retail um, retail phenomena during 2020. or uh, And so they do used to talk about unusual options activity. And again, if, if you are full time on uh, doing trading, probably will work out. That never worked out for me. 
uh, because you have to be really very nimble around trading around those unusual options uh, activities. And sometimes, um, you know, those big positions, the unusual options, uh, we do the signals that we get from unusual options. Sometimes there our interpretation is right. Sometimes it's it's not. It may not be correct because we don't have full full information. So for me, it's like 50 50. So I don't focus on that anymore. Uh, Vivek, go ahead. Uh, I found the guy doing options uh, informative, but the thing is. You have to be an active trader to know what's going on exactly, and you can't. That's why you can't follow CNBC. Yeah, you. And uh, but it was very because when he failed, he would tell us what went wrong, and that's yeah, very yeah. important. So I, so I, I would suggest don't follow anyone. I think you might just learn from some, but don't follow anyone. Uh, again, everyone's style is different. I don't do look at unusual options activity because. That would need me to be very nimble, and uh, and be quick, and that means always watching the markets. And you know, I can't do that. I'm only part time. Uh, you know, got a full time job, have to work. Um, you know, got I got my full time work and family and other stuff to do. So I don't focus on that. I don't. That's the reason. But the way I will do is to. Make sure I don't have to be always watching the market, but yeah, uh, there are many investors and you know who focus on uh, unusual uh, options activity. Uh, if you if you are a podcast, uh, uh, you know, a, a fan, um, Option Insider Radio Network. Uh, one of their post podcasts is around option blocks. They do talk about some of the unusual option activity uh, that uh, they have seen in the week. But again, it's like 50-50. Uh, and they do come back and review those activities on in terms of what they thought the, the unusual option activity might be indicating and what actually happened, right? So, yeah, I do listen to them sometimes, you know, during my walk, et cetera. But again, uh, like I said, doesn't, um, I don't trade based on that. I do listen to it to think why someone would do it in terms of has anything changing in the business. But that's again, uh, one more uh, avenue if you want to uh, know about unusual option activity. Uh, Steve's a go to barcha.com. Thank you, Steve, uh, for sharing that. Yeah, I never looked at that one. Okay. All right. All right, let's, let's uh, get going. Yeah, so today I do want to talk about uh, some earnings and, of course, the, the biggest news or the movers and the shakers of the market, uh, which was our inflation number that came out on Friday. And surprised everyone. I I don't you know, I don't know why why market has been uh, so uh, assuming that the Fed is gonna pivot soon. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, one other thing I want to do is to also get in the details of fear and greed index. This is the index that we look at almost every week. We look at this index, but I never gotten into the detail or shared in terms of how this index is calculated. Uh, so we're going to do that as well today. Right. Okay. So let's uh, jump uh, into that. But before that, let's look at a story, uh, a really wild story. I was, uh, it's pretty inspiring as well. So I thought I'll share here with you. Uh, this is a story of uh, how failed passion project turned into one of the most iconic apps. And I would also say it turned out to be the one of the best acquisition ever um, of a company. Okay. So uh, he spent, he left Google frustrated, uh, spent almost three years at product manager, wanted to take more responsibility, but instead his boss told, you know, you should pick up golf to be happy. His next step was next stop a location recommendation app startup. But with Foursquare leading the way, check-in apps were all the rage in late 2000s. Small team, Kevin could get more responsibility. He would take initiative. 
he jumped onto this one year of honing his coding skills he decided to take create a checkup app of its own all right maybe you now you got a maybe you're getting a hint of which app i am talking about which became wildly successful but uh, let's continue on this one a hostel in mexico seemed like the right place to pursue the terrible idea so he packed his flip flops bought two tickets out of california for himself and for his girlfriend and the second ticket became the best investment kevin system ever made okay now i given up the name so probably you know you know uh so he got his girlfriend's ticket as well you should probably add filters so bourbon was his first grown up brain child sounded good on paper unlike other check in apps it allowed users to post photos and videos along with their check in so moving from a four square where you check in your location now say hey i'm or i'm checking my location but here's my photo or video uh but girlfriend oh, okay also had some filters investors like that idea receive two checks one from uh baseline ventures i jana i have not heard of that i i know it there is a bessemer ventures maybe there is another one baseline ventures and from andreson totaling $500000 so half a million dollar uh, initial funding bourbon was easy to build but it was even easier for users to forget right 80 people that's how many joined bourbon over 9 months 80 people he recalls having his friends meet at his parents uh, meet his parents via the app and reconnecting with long lost acquaintances right bourbon but whenever he showed the app to the outsiders aka potential users like you and me they would nod enthusiastically and dismiss the app a few minutes later all right during the mexico trip kevin asked his girlfriend why she didn't post any pictures on bourbon she said iPhone 4 photos don't look as good as some of Kevin's friend. He explained that his friend was using photo filters. So Kevin says, she goes, "Oh well, you should use filters too." We came back from that walk. I went straight to the room, got on my laptop, made the first filter which was X Pro 2. Within weeks, Bourbon was stripped of all features except photo sharing. so no location checking nothing else you just share a photo the gutted version uh, this server right F- less future less feature make it easy to use gutted on version was downloaded 25000 times whereas bourbon had what 90 uh, or 80 users in 9 months after making easy 25000 on day 1 what do you call an app that sends instant camera shots at the speed of a telegram that became instagram so that's the story of a uh, pretty inspiring story around uh, instagram and then we all know this got bought over by facebook at a billion dollars and uh, if you now look at the overall worth of instagram is tens of billions of dollars not hundreds of billions of dollar to the overall facebook uh, valuation right what this is along with the youtube acquisition by alphabet google uh, instagram is hailed as one of the best acquisition ever uh, in the history of mnd but that's how it started and that's what it says he hit goes he took his girlfriend's advice to add uh, filters to the application remove everything else and uh, you know it just just worked so often times the first things you build won't work but if we focus on what your users find valuable laser focus on that and listen to your girlfriend you can also strike gold that's a valuable lesson so pretty wild story of how instagram i didn't know about it i just uh, you know read it on uh, on twitter Uh, so i thought i'll share another wild story is what's happening in bay area ramesh has question did he marry her or uh, i i don't know I'll, i i haven't i haven't done that uh, investigation and the morale of the story like ross says behind every successful idea is a yeah what what i wonder is how much did his girlfriend get out of that billion dollar right 
those will be maybe part two of our story. What happens next? But coming, continuing on the wild story, this is what's happening in Bay Area. It's the first time I've been in this place for almost 14 years. First time in the last 14 years, I saw so much of a snow in Bay Area. And this is those who are from Bay Area. Uh, you, this is 237. I've been driving down uh, from uh, 237 towards uh, Milpitas. And I'm like, what the heck? So much snow. No wonder the temperature here has been, you know, mid 40s for past whole week. Uh, and uh, and with my friends and all that, we've been sharing photos of uh, in a free. <clears throat> there's a Fremont, uh, you know, there's a Fremont Mission Peak. There's a high that's fully covered with snow. You can actually. I've never seen that. Everyone is so amazed that there's so much of a snow happening in and around Bay Area. And this is, you know, so you think climate change is all causing this. Now we don't have to go, you know, drive three hours or four hours uh, for any snow. Uh, unfortunately, there are no ski or anything that you can do here. Because this area was never developed as a ski resort, right? For any snow-like activities. But uh, there are some trails on which now you'll find snow. Uh, yeah, that, that's another wild one. Everyone was surprised. Yeah, it looks like Colorado. <clears throat> Cool. And the last one before we jump to what I'm, am I reading? I recently started this book. I heard a lot about this book. I actually went to library because my kid wanted to go and pick up some books. So I was just killing some time there and uh, was just uh, looking at the shelves. And I found this book, A Random Walk Down the Wall Street. I have heard of this book. If anyone of you have read it already, uh, do let me know. But this is what I just started. I'm like just 10 pages uh, into this book. So we'll share, you know, <clears throat> a good book, but there is nothing random on Wall Street. <clears throat> or maybe it used to be random. Uh, and that is why, uh, again, I, I am still a little, you know, at some part of a, a portion of my mind still say that markets are still random. The move in the stock is not connected. I mean, the whole idea of it being random is the move, the next move is not, uh, the, the outcome of your next step is not related to the outcome of a previous step, right? So what happens to the stock, um, it, let's say tomorrow's movement is unrelated to this. Uh, I know some people subscribe to it. Some people do not, especially if you are uh, focused on uh, technical charting, then yes, there are patterns. It's not random. <clears throat> but uh, uh, if you are uh, those purists, uh, then the markets are random. Yeah. Uh, Steve, exactly nothing random on Wall Street, all manipulated by a few. Uh, especially with the topic of today's beat. Uh, agreed. Uh, well, let's see. <clears throat> so well, maybe should I pick some other book? I mean, I had heard about this book, so I thought, okay, let me read this one. Uh, Ramesh says, and in Michigan, ski and snow shoveling's business are suffering. Uh, maybe we we got some Michigan snow over here. All right. Uh, so at a macro level, what did we see? Triple whammy uh, this uh, end of the week. First of all, hotter than expect, uh, expected inflation. Uh, inflation month over month rose 0.6%. Also the December figure was revised. And uh, you know, this is fun. Uh, I think we talked about December figure in a previous session that, and, and at that point of a time, when we discussed in the last session, and I was surprised that why this is not in news that the the inflation figure has been revised up by 0.1%. I think market was too much uh, drinking its own Kool-Aid, uh, you know, just ignored everything else. But this week when the market fell down, then you start to see, oh, you know, December figures was also revised. Anyway, the December figures were revised from 4.6 to 4.7%. So inflation is not cooling down. That's one. Second is the personal spending. 
Consumer spending rose a solid 1.8% in January. Consumers are still spending. Right? We don't see any decrease in it. This is the biggest increase in nearly two years. Right? Well above the expectation. And not only this, even the, the, the sentiment, which is, uh, you know, Umich sentiment, the consumer survey sentiment, the expectations were all in Feb were also revised higher. So inflation came higher. The expectations, uh, consumer feeling about the economy is higher. And also consumer is spending, uh, you know, it's showing uh, through its, its pocket. So the spending was also up at 1.8%. In the sign of solid household balance sheets, sales of new single family homes also reached their highest level since March, 2022. Okay. So stronger consumer, higher inflation, uh, markets were like, oh, yeah, Fed is not gonna pivot. Yeah. So in the start of a year, when the Fed did 25 basis points, I don't know for which, whatever reason, in the conference, press conference, for whatever reason, markets started assuming that Fed is going to be, uh, you know, dovish. I'm like, there was nothing that they said um, that they're going to be dovish soon. So now you're realizing, hmm, maybe um, Fed won't pivot. Rather, we are looking to have a higher inflation, terminal inflation rate, almost close to 6%. Right? And now the market is... is the 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 percent uh, the probability of a fifty basis points hike, uh, you know, is, is higher, and that moved up from twenty five to fifty basis points. So, any of these uh, is not good for stocks, and that's what we saw, maybe on Thursday and Friday. I don't know which day was it. Maybe on both the days, markets were really really weak. We gave up, uh, uh, you know, a lot of gains. Uh, I think I do have some numbers. Um, yeah, it ended up in red on Friday. Majority majority of the those things were red. This is S and P five hundred, um, and not just the market. Even the you know the crypto market uh, again. The these are risk on stuff. Also ended up red. If you look at seven days, uh, Bitcoin down almost six and a half percent. Ethereum at six percent. Um. <clears throat> It was a worst weekly loss since early December. And at its close on Friday, index had surrendered roughly 35% of the rally that began in October. Uh, so now it's still up 3.4%. This seems to be more reasonable than 7%, 8% S&P up. And NASDAQ was up, like at some week it was up 16%. And, you know, that's where we've been talking. We already got all the gains of the year, right? 8% S&P is what an average, you can get between eight to 10% over long term. And uh, we got that in first two, three weeks, too much too soon. Uh, same was the case with NASDAQ. So I'm not surprised to see all these coming down. Dow Jones actually ended negative for the year, uh, but uh, all these were down from a previous week. But I think still NASDAQ up it almost 9% in seven weeks. Well, still on the higher side. I think over, from uh, the way the earnings have moved, I think they're still on, on the higher side. But right now, the markets are moving. For, they're forgetting anything about earnings or whatever. Right now, all uh, what's moving the market is is Fed is gonna you know cut the interest rate, or when the when Fed will uh, stop increasing the interest rate as a first point, and then when they will start to cut down the interest rates, that's all is driving at a macro level. That's what driving the the big changes in the market. Uh, I see, Steve. Now you can read a book by asking Chat GPT. What are the key points in random walk down the Wall Street? That's a good idea. Twenty dollars per month. Chat GPT. But the only problem with the Chat GPT is you cannot do it for the new books because the models were trained based on maybe last 
were, was 2021. Oh, I think that the, its knowledge base is two years old. Uh, number two is you always have to go back and check the facts because chat GPT lies in such a convincingly manner that you won't even know whether it's lying or whether it's uh, true. But when it comes to summarizing the information from a book or an article, yeah, I think that's that's the use case for which we can use chat GPT right now. But we cannot use it for, I mean, we always have to do fact checking if you're looking at for some real numbers or some facts. Uh, Raspberry Blink List is crying. I think Blink List is the app which uh, gives you what 30 minutes or one hour. Um, it's an audio app, or that's what I heard, which gives you a summary of the books. I think that's what now you can do that through Chat GPT. Why do you need Blink List? You know what might happen, uh, Ross? Maybe Blink List will start to integrate with Chat GPT APIs and bring down their cost of. Um, uh, creating the app. <clears throat> so I don't think that chat GPT, you know, in, when it comes to the regular usage of chat GPT, as a consumer, we will be using it in the chat box. But I think the other apps that we are comfortable using it uh, will start to use chat GPT behind the scene to make their own apps better, right? So I'm not gonna, let's say if, if I have a blank list, I'm not gonna ditch blank list, but eventually there will be either blank list or some app, which has got a lot of other features than just providing a summary, right? If it's an audio, I can run it at 1.25 or 1.5 at the speed, I can pause it, maybe I can bookmark some of the stuff and all that. But many of these consumer facing apps will start to use either chat GPT or whatever, you know, other forms or, or large language models um in to make themselves uh, more competitive and better products so uh, it will be like we will always interact with those old big ai models through another uh, user facing uh, applications that's that's where i see the most usage i think directly us uh, right now it's on hype i don't know but i heard how many users does chat gpt got now they had uh, I'm um, just I'm just looking for they already got 100 million users. Ooh. That's that's a great number, right? They just started with they unveiled this in December or maybe end of November, somewhere like that. And right now they already have 100 million users. So, but yeah, I think this this whole hype cycle uh, will will be over at some point of a time. But where I see the most application of these AIs are the existing businesses who will have to either they change themselves or they go out of business and someone else will replace them, right? Just like mobile did that. So Facebook was there even prior. Also, we also used to shop earlier on laptops or on your desktop. And, you know, the same companies just use the new technology to become more efficient give better user experience, became mobile friendly in the growth is, you know, that showed up uh, in their business growth. Same, I think this tech will get uh, uh, embedded into the existing products that we are already using. Uh, increased consumer spending by dollar at the same item now cost more. Yeah, possibly, I don't think those numbers are inflation adjusted though. I can raise my sale price 100 basic points. I don't care 50 uh, basis points uh, in interest. But I think there will be at some part of a time. Uh, again, the Fed is also looking at the at the at the same way. Is at what part of a time does the consumer start to break and say, you know, I can't afford it anymore, right? So right now the job market is still strong. So I think first of all. We need to see, and, and I read about some stats saying we need to have around million or to two million job losses if we want to get the inflation, you know, to get inflation under control. It's a, it's a bad scenario, but it, the reality is we need to have a couple of million uh, people uh, unemployed, additional people unemployed to bring the inflation down. 
and if fed is if that's what the fed is targeting for uh, you know they'll continue to march on that companies will increase the interest rate but at some part of a time uh, consumers will say okay i'm going to postpone my uh, purchase of this or if companies cannot pass on that um, uh, increase in the cost they'll have to lay off people so in either case the the whole idea is the consumption or the demand of the goods will go down and then inflation will come down but we'll see or uh, overall s and p how did it do this week all ended up in red and no surprises the the volatile sectors communication discretionary were the worst performing one almost down 5% right but there were no survivors uh this week everything ended up in red looking at the free air in greed index it is still in in uh, large in the greed space we won't think that after this week say uh, you know a decline uh, is it right on the market is still in greed and that's where i thought maybe let's dig a little deeper to understand how is this fear and greed uh, calculated so less under so this has been in decline over last few uh, weeks but still above i guess 55 which is where is the 50 to 60 is a neutral and then gets into the greed so what is this uh, fear and greed index right it's a way to gauge stock market movements and whether stocks are fairly priced is based on a logic that excessive fear tends to drive down share prices too much greed tends to have opposite effect how is it calculated is a compilation of seven different indicators so it's not based on one but seven different indicators uh, we'll go through that look at that uh, uh, you know below in terms of how they calculate and also it is used to gauge the mood of the market many investors are emotional and re reactionary and these sentiment indicators can alert investor to their own emotions and biases right so first one is market momentum uh it is useful to look at stock market levels compared to where they have been over past few months when snp is above moving or rolling average of the prior 125 days it's a sign of positive momentum if it is lower than that it's a uh, uh, then the investors are uh, getting a uh, skittish right so that's one second is a stock price strength so this one currently shows uh, it's a neutral overall at a uh, you know snp side it's a neutral now stock price strength a few big stocks can skew the returns for the market uh, we all know about it very clearly because the big ones especially the snp 5 uh, this is based on snp 500 and it is skewed because it market weighted it is skewed towards the bigger stocks it is important to know how many stocks are doing well versus those that are struggling uh this okay this one shows the nyse no sorry not snp this shows the number of stock in nyse at 52 weeks highs compared to those as 52 weeks lows while there are many more highs than lows that is a bullish signal and signals greed third one is a breadth stock market is made of thousands of stocks any given day investors are actively buying and selling them so this looks at the amount or the volume of shares on nyse that are rising compared to the shares that are falling fourth is a put and call options right so this is the one which i have heard many times uh, you know so using it looking at the put and call volume to get an idea of where the market may be moving but uh, this overall uh, fear and greed index is actually much looks at many other parameters uh, put and call is one of them right. <clears throat> so puts are option to uh, to sell when the calls are options to buy that's fine when ratio of puts to call is rising then we assume that there is more uncertainty in the markets so people want to a uh, buy more protection might be more bearish if it is more than one uh if it is less than one then it means hey, it's a it's a bullish signal 
Next is the volatility, which is a VIX indicator. We probably all know about it. Uh, other two were new to me. Uh, safe Haven demand, which is basically a demand for your uh, uh, bonds. And last is a junk bond demand, which is your high yield bonds. So these are the seven indicators that this um, fear and greed indicator takes into account and then comes up with the final score of what the number is, right? So right now the number is still at uh, 59, which is in greed. And I don't know, was it last session? Not last session, I think maybe a session prior to that. Um, I had plotted the fear and greed indicator versus the S&P 500 performance. Right? And it was kind of a, you know, one is to one. So it was, uh, when it's a one is to one in terms of, you know, when it was market as it agreed, uh, as it was higher, and then, you know, market sold off uh, because, you know, just after it was at a greed or extreme greed. So it is what it is, just an indicator. Again, don't make your final decision based on this, but it does help to look at the well-rounded indicator, which is comprised of, you know, all these parameters except just the VIX or just put call ratios. Ross, can you look at AAI investment sentiment? Also, Ross, do you have a website where I can find this? I had never, okay, let me just Google this and see what is say AAI sentiment survey. Cool. Okay, I will add this and uh, Oh, this is the AIA members wheel where the stock market will be next six months. Uh, so this is the concern I have is looking at other, you know, getting the market direction by either talking to analysts or by talking to other investors uh, because individually all of us are very bad in, in predicting, but maybe this just tells us the, what called the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, this might be showing the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, but yeah, I think this is what it says. It's an AI members field. Uh, maybe if individually we are wrong, maybe as a crowd, we we probably will get it right. Okay, so yeah, so we'll look at it. I'll, I'll try to read a little more on this one, on what exactly this means. Uh, I have trouble understanding how put call ratios actually in the indicator. Um, I have the same question. That is why I don't uh, pay too much attention to it because number one, uh, you don't know whether it's uh, like Steve, you mentioned that you don't know whether the puts and the calls are short or long. All you know that these were traded. Even if you know that the put and the calls were long or short, even then you can't uh, make a determination whether it's a bearish move or whether it's a bullish move, right? for the particular investor. You might find that strange because how can you say that if I bought a put, I am not bearish about this. Okay. Even if you know that I bought a put, I might still be bullish about the stock because the uh, you can still use options to do your stock replacement strategies or you might be using option to protect your much bigger holding of a stock so you are still very be bullish on a stock but might have taken a little bit of insurance that doesn't make you bearish on the stock so yeah but when i look at it i'm like i don't know if i can really uh, you know uh, put my money behind this indicator but yeah a lot of people talk about this indicator I'm like, even if you tell me that this is a long put, I still can't say it with a guarantee that you are a bearish or you're a bullish on the stock, unless I know the rest of your portfolio, which we never know. Only thing that we get to know is, uh, is an indicator, right? but, but it is being used. And I, so I like at least this fear and greed uh, overall index because hey, it's not based just on put and call options. So, <clears throat> It, it's a, it include a lot more other uh, uh, sentiments or indicators as well. 
Steve, anyone knows how to overlay fear and greed index or S and SPY in Think or Sim? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, if you can find out, uh, maybe share it, share it with us in in the next session. Uh, if people only trade spreads, put call is always uh, one. Uh, can I explain? It may not be. But when you talk about a spread, it's the same. Um, the type of option right either it's a spread basically means buy call sell call or sell call buy call uh but i could for example i've been mostly doing the spreads on the call side so in that case for me um you might consider me as uh as as a bearish one but i'm not bearish because i have i'm just doing that as a protection for a much bigger bullish portfolio which is the long stock position yeah, it's not a good indicator. So uh, coming to my own, again, uh, in terms of transparency and disclosure, I bought a little bit of EEM. And when I said these, these are the long stock position change in the active portfolio, not in the, I mean, these are not the ones on the retirement side, but on the active portfolio where I trade options actively, bought a little bit of a EEM. Uh, again, continuing my thesis around Emerging markets are, I mean, US market is way more or, over expensive than the emerging markets uh, and streamed a little portion of, you know, in uh, NVIDIA. So let's now look at, now we have what, uh, almost 50 minutes. We have an hour to go. Uh, we're going to look at some charts, then we can jump on to earnings. Uh, <clears throat> Asha, if you have anything else. Uh, example, buy a call and buy a put at the same time. Yeah, if you buy a call, buy a put. I mean, there are multiple uh, different option strategies. Uh, yeah, you could do a strangle. In that case, put and the call will cancel each other. I mean, you bought mm -hmm. one put, you bought one call. But I think the whole put call ratio is overall the collective um you know collectively across all the puts and the calls that have been that have happened on on the market or on a particular stock is what put call ratio refers to all right so our market still overvalued uh, so overvalued if you believe uh, stanfield capital in their opinion it still is right so even though we had a correction, right now S and P is up three point four percent year to date. You know, but if you look at the fundamentals or the earnings, and this is a little dated. I think it's Feb eighteen, so it's almost a week old. But with eighty four percent, so this does not include the earnings that we had this week, but this is as of last week, eighty four percent of S and P having reported earnings. Earnings came at $38.38, which annualizes to $153. Now, uh, you know, even if you assume that the, the rate stays same, companies will be able to make the same level of earnings. 16x multiple will put SNP as 245 or SPY at 245, SPX at 2456. That's very scary. Right, right now um we are at 390 right or close to 390 396 from a 396 if you really look at the the earnings with a 16x multiple we're looking at 2500 okay let's look at maybe trailing 12 months right uh, and do that multiple is still 275. So that is still almost 30% down from where the market is current, currently is. If you prefer operating earnings, not the gap earnings, which is a net income, the Q4 is coming at almost 50, means uh, 198 annualized, TTM is 196. 15X multiple on operating earnings still brings the S&P to uh, 
15 X multiples put the S&P at 298, <clears throat> almost 100, uh, you know, units less uh, than where, uh, 1000 points less than where it currently is. And 16 X multiple is 318. So this is where 318 or 320 is what uh, Mike Wilson, the Morgan Stanley's analyst has been talking about. And he has been, again, uh, one of the analysts who has been very bearish. Again, some analysts are bearish, some analysts are bullish. Don't make your final decision based on that. Uh, but 320 is a, is a level which I hear Mike Wilson talking time and again saying, Markets are way overvalued looking at the earnings and looking at the headwinds uh, on the earnings that we are seeing in the markets. And his target is market go down to 320. Uh, what Stephen Capital says, I have had my ass handed to me in 23 being very net short. Yeah, if we were short in 23, uh, except this previous week, the markets were all green, right? All gaga. But I'm as convinced as ever that market is... Uh, Will equal hanging in midair over the cliff and about to take a giant plunge as liquidity again reverses and 5% risk free in six month T will makes cash as an asset class. I 100% agree to this. As, as, a, you know, as an individual investor, I myself have been stashing all the extra cash into T bills. I mean, at least you have a guarantee of 5%. So on an average, when the SPY will give you eight to 10%, but with the risk, here you have a 5% guaranteed, uh, no risk. I'm assuming US government is not gonna default. Uh, we'll have a much bigger problem if that happens. <laughs> we won't be talking about stocks. Uh, but yeah, you can make it easily, make it 5%, close to 5%. I think the last T-bill, uh, and you know, I've been building my T-bill ladder. The last T-bill, which I got was at 4.8% for 17 weeks. So I have my 17 weeks T-bill ladder, which is what, four months? So I'm like, unless I find something really, really exciting, I'll just hold on cash and uh, stash the cash in T-bill. And, and uh, you know, uh, wait, I'm not taking, I'm not taken much out of the market but uh, not putting too much in the market because there are other options available, which is like T-bills. Before this year, uh, no, before last year, right? Before 2022, I never in bought any T-bills. Those were yielding almost close to 0%, right? So, but now as an investor, you know, I, I won't ignore this especially when you're looking at some of the expenses that you might have some big expense coming in a year, et cetera. You don't want to take a chance with the market for the next winner expense and you can get a 5%. Why not? Right? Uh, absent fundamental improvement, would uh, what would change my mind? If the S&P take out this early February high of 4195, I'll start thinking that maybe stocks are seeing something that I'm not and will revert from net short to roughly market neutral unless until they break down again. To clarify, the current earnings 3838 is estimate for 100% of companies, right? Using 84% of the actual, so basically pro rate to all the 100% of the companies, and the number has been trending steadily lower. S&P, when we started the earnings cycle, S&P's um, earnings were 41. And after like three or four weeks of earnings cycle, when 84% of companies have reported, uh, now the S&P is the, sorry, the earnings is 38.38. And now maybe in another two weeks, if it is lower than this, the market seems to be way more uh, hyped up than uh, what the earnings suggest. Right? And the truth is, after the press conference, and there was no reason for market to just assume that Fed will pivot. Uh, but that's that's exactly what the market did. The, uh, and um, we saw those great gains. And 
for me, the first month or let's say the first six weeks till now have been painful when it comes to the options. I won't complain at the overall portfolio side, but the options, all those hedge trades, uh, I had to close, uh, basically keep rolling it at a losses, right? Whereas the same strategies that worked in 2022 hasn't worked in for the first six weeks of uh, 2023. Uh, but we'll see, you know, those are the hedge trades. It's it's good sign that you lose money on your hedge trades because the rest of the portfolio is, is okay. All right, Steve, if the rates go down, goes from 4.5 to 5.5%, a 20% rise and assume TLT goes down accordingly, 20%. Short TLT IEF is better than 5% T bill. Yeah, TLT, yeah, I have, uh, oh, that's one where I have uh, positions um, on option side also. I, I don't know exactly, uh, or, or maybe I haven't done enough analysis on is it like one is to one or how exactly do they do they move? The, the problem why I'm looking at the T bill, uh, I prefer T bill for any, uh, you know, upcoming uh, future expenses where I need to have a guarantee is I'm not going to sell it in the market before expiration, right? Before maturity, if you're trying to sell T-bill, then it's anybody's game on whether you're going to make money or lose money. Uh, but if you hold the stuff till maturity, then you're guaranteed to make whatever that uh, your coupon rate is 4%. 4.8%, 5%, whatever that is. And for the expenses for which I need that guarantee, I'll pick T-bill. And uh, uh, because TLT or any of the bonds that are freely traded in the market, um, those are dependent on how the interest rates move up and down. Uh, and uh, yeah, if interest rates goes higher, TLT goes down. I agree, but I don't know how ex you know how much will it go up or how much will it go down. So, so that's why uh, I actually started building position uh, in TLT. Uh, I think last year, thinking maybe Fed will start to go. Uh, Fed will start to cut rates, cut rates. Uh, so, but that hasn't happened. So yeah, so right now, you know, in next few months for, I will do clearly from a bullish perspective because maybe at some point of a time, Fed will stop raising interest rates. But if you think the Fed will continue to do it uh, uh, and the market will discount TLT, TLT is a long 20 year plus uh, bonds, then yeah, you could look at shorting TLT. All right. Uh, I mean, the TLD would have uh, taught a great lesson to any investors, any bond investors who were told that buy bonds because bonds don't lose value. Those are the protection against the stock. Uh, nothing was farther than truth in whole of 2022. Stock lost value as well as bonds horribly lost value, right? So it was somewhat of a time, I think 2020, why not here? Let's go back and look at here. high was one seven one 2020 mid of 2020 it was 170 bucks. Like it closed it started um 2022 with near 150 TLT and stock got dec decimated by 25% in 2022. Uh, and the uh, bonds as well. So big surprise uh, on how the these bonds would behave in the market. Uh, <clears throat> it, you know, whole 60, 40 portfolio. I mean, we talked about uh, earlier also, those all investors who were holding the mix of stocks and the bonds thinking they cancel each other had a very nasty surprise. They didn't, didn't cancel each other. So that is why if I'm looking for some guaranteed uh, a guaranteed return, I thought for my own personal money, I'll put it in a in a, in a T bill and won't take it out before maturity. 
my point is that by theory now as most people are doing may not be a good idea doing the opposite is likely making gains yeah i mean if fed will continue to raise the interest rates uh, then this will go down i mean they uh, the that's a rates and the and the bond prices uh, move inversely all right uh, moving on what else uh, market is on hype cycle chat gpt is also going through its own hype cycle and uh, these are the times the company mentioned ai during the earnings call nvidia said ai 91 times and that is why i'm like oh, that's too much too soon i'm a little little bearish not bearish but i am a little concerned about this whole jump in nvidia and nvidia is up what 60 percent uh for a year i think that's what it is do i have nvidia in my words list uh no so let's say nvidia it's 59.34 percent year to date it's 60 percent up year to date oh there it is yeah so anyway too much hyped um google said 68 times microsoft 46 times um even check talk about 21 times even fiverr i don't think i have it here even fiverr is talking about the ai so right now to me ai is looking like the the dot com the blockchains everyone just name dropping you know those uh two letters ai and see uh, some movement in the stock so i'm very very cautious in terms of doing any ai plays any pure play ai plays the market is super heated up uh, alphabet uh as you guys know their bard which is supposed to be a competitor to the chat gpt uh answered one question wrong and then it dropped more than it dropped during the earning miss right uh so it, it's like if you can get if you get any answers on AI wrong, you're worthless kind of a stuff. Too much overreaction, both on the positive side as well as on the negative side. That makes me think too much hype on uh, on uh, on the whole AI stuff. And uh, <clears throat> this I read came in I think uh, yesterday. Wall Street uh, chat Ghibli nightmare is over before it starts as banks crack down on using chat GPT. Right. Uh, and we were talking about we can use chat GPT to summarize article. Maybe it is good for that. Uh, but a few examples of some of the folks at the Wall Street wanted to use it, but really it wasn't helping. A salesperson at a bank wanted to use to uh, on his personal device. The task was completed in less time, no doubt about it. And this is where the productivity will come in. But it couldn't be used in internal report and has to be cross-checked for accuracy. Right. You just can't believe right now, whatever comes out of the mouth of Chat GPT, if it is accurate or not, because factually, I mean, uh, I mean, it's been uh, fun, and you can see a lot of Twitter posts around how inaccurate some of the uh, information uh, put forth by Chat GPT has been. And the most interesting one, and I forgot the name, and I don't have that tweet. I'm sorry, but it's a. Uh, I haven't heard that person's name, but it looks like he's a famous person. And uh, his own record, was, which Chad GPT threw about him, was completely wrong. And I think he also called him like he, that he's dead by now, some kind of a stuff. <laughs> and then people was commenting on it. It was complete. His, his accomplishments were wrong. I think he founded three or four companies. Uh, one of them... Uh, chat GPT got correct and all others were wrong uh, all those were incorrect so still way more I mean I'm bullish about this tech as a whole but not right now it's like yeah internet uh, you know it took time for Google to become accurate or let me put it this way before Google we had Axe Jeeves you know we had Lycos now I'm, I'm talking some of you may not Depending on what generation you belong to, these may be a foreign uh, words for you. You may not have heard these words. 
Lycos and Asgis. Uh, Chat GPT looks to be a reincarnation, reincarnation of uh, Ask Jeeves. Right? Uh, <clears throat> but so an oil trader used Chat GPT and the information was out of date and had to be fixed. A stock trader in Taipei used it to compile key takeaways. Uh, still, it made this decision based on his own notes. Bond trader. China wrote routine reports and policy analysis using AI, but he spent a lot of time, she spent a lot of time, you know, doing a uh, fact checking. And some of the results were disastrously flawed and then they, they just couldn't use it. So I guess there's a lot, there's, this will be real, no doubt. It's going to be a real deal, but I guess it's a few years down the line, not right now. But the stocks have been moving based on uh, as if, uh, you know, it's going to change the world tomorrow. It'll take a long time. I see a link, Ross says, Reuters AI created images lose copyright tests. Uh, okay. Yeah, so there have been, uh, I think there are two companies, uh, Stable Diffusion and uh, DALI 3. Both of these, uh, uh, DALI 3 is again from the uh, open AI. Uh, which also had this chat GPT-3. I think stable diffusion is a different one, but they all got sued because they were feeding the copyrighted images in training these AI models. And worst come worst, even they did check, to, they should have at least removed the watermarked images. Uh, it was so blatant use of uh, copyrighted images that even the water, watermarked images were used by uh i don't was it a stable if so getty has sued sued them uh and uh, i don't was a stable diffusion or or someone else whichever one of these they had used watermark images to train the models and uh you know now they are getting sued so there's a lot of uh legality you know we need to work through it <clears throat> if chat gpt has been trained by using an article that i wrote and then and they making money of it no citation for me no leaks for me how am i gonna make any money so so there's a there's a lot more work yet to be done and the eventual again it's again a wild thought right the the players that may benefit from this may not be the tech companies maybe the companies which have got a good content could be the winners out of this Right, because now these it, not just Chat GPT, but any company producing these big models, large language models, or which combine information from the whole internet to summarize it. Uh, if legally they have to pay buddy to from where they can collect the information, maybe those players could be be, be the winners. Right? A lot there's so much of uncertainty and a lot more stuff still new to be you know, worked around on, on this one. And uh, that's the reason why I believe open AI investors, the early investors, the VCs in open AI were okay to sell their company at a valuation of what, $20 billion? Right? If this is a world changing technology, $20 billion is nothing. So why did they sell 49% of their stake to Microsoft at just $10 billion? Because they know that, hey, right now it's a hype, let's in cash on it. And uh, there's way more work, a lot more work still to be done to make it really, really usable. Right. So $20 billion, you know, there are many companies which, which are junk companies that are, more than, are valued more than $20 billion. So why did OpenAI sold themselves at such a low valuation? has to be reason they know a lot more than we do in terms of where the this tech is in their maturity cycle yeah <clears throat> but here this one is a real deal which i came across uh, this week is apple makes progress on no prick blood glucose tracking and probably that will be embedded into its watch right now i never knew about this one i don't think market 
you know, ever talked about Apple working on this tech, but this is a moonshot style project. It's been happening since Steve Jobs. So it's nothing new. But right now, this week, they hit a major milestone in, uh, you know, be able to tell your blood glucose monitor without going through the process of, you know, sucking the blood out. That's what, like, the, the current, the other ones, uh, you know, the <clears throat> there are other companies from Dexcom and there are, I think, Abbott Labs. They have these uh, devices which will help you to monitor blood sugar. And when this news came out, uh, they lost a, a few percentage was shaven off their market cap as well. But again, <clears throat> this is uh, measure the glucose without needing to prick the skin for a blood. So after hitting a major milestone recently, the company now believes it could eventually bring a glucose monitoring to the market. And this is a multi-billion dollar industry. And the, the beauty about this Apple is this big billion dollars of industry will just become a small app in your watch. Right? Roughly one in 10 Americans have diabetes and they rely on devices that poke their skin. Right? But what Apple is trying to do is using a chip, a chip tech called silicon photonics and a measurement process of optical absorption spectroscopy. So basically, you it emit a laser of a wavelength below the skin where you have this interstitial fluid, right? Now, the how much of the light is reflected back will tell you what's the concentration of glucose in in your blood, right? And again, it it has already taken them like say twelve years. They've been working on it. This was being not done under the normal Apple operations but it was being done under a different health tech startup. So this was even more secretive than the Apple's uh, TV project, Apple car project. Hundreds of engineers were working on this project as a part of Apple Exploratory Design Group, XDG. Um, and a fewer, even fewer people are involved in this than the self-driving car which is or then the or the mixed reality headset. Apple is secretive, but this is even more secretive than their other secret projects, which is like self-driving car and the mixed reality headsets. Not many people knows about this XDG group. Right? It's been 12 years in the making, and it's the first time that there was a news. Right? And uh, right now, the device has uh, the one which they're currently been able to figure out, the device is of an iPhone size, which can be strapped to person's bicep, right? Right now, it's not at a stage where it can be moved into your app, uh, iWatch. But the fact that now they are able to uh, get into proof of concept stage after 12 years, and now they're talking to regulators, uh, you know, for all the regulatory approvals. But it's still considered a moonshot. Maybe Apple is, I don't know, maybe a few hundred million dollars that they're putting in this for Apple. Who cares a couple of few hundred million dollars, right? So these are the moonshot project. But if this works out, it's going to be, a, it's going to revolutionize another sector of healthcare, which is your diabetes manager. And not just... Um, preventing, uh, sorry, not just measuring the diabetes, but I think there was somewhere, oh, maybe I don't have that, where it actually warn you if you are a pre-diabetic. Um, oh, no, okay, it'll be there. One of the goals is to create a preventive measure and warn people if they are pre-diabetic so that they can then change their lifestyle uh, accordingly. And now with your, you know, the watch is becoming uh, basically your, I would say, a healthcare center. They already have all your activities you can monitor. You can monitor your heartbeat. You can monitor, like, kind of take kind of an ECG and all other stuff. Uh, you can get your um, blood pressure uh, with this one. It's going to be another one. Right? But again, right now, still at a proof of concept stage, even after 12 years, but now they made 
to a uh, up to a level where they think this could actually work out right and of course they also have to shrink it from the size of an iphone to an app which they can then fit into your apple watch right so apple watch has become more of a health tool now right it has got a heart rate sensor uh, earlier it was only focused on fitness tracking and all that but now have a electrocardiogram ecgs it can sensor body temperature right blood oxygen levels so Apple will design the silicon chips, and I think they're gonna work with TSMC to manufacture those chips. But this is a, this is a real deal. We have seen Apple creating and getting into a new business segment, you know, and uh, in a few years, then we started going. That's like a multi-billion-dollar business. Did the same thing with services. Did the same thing with watch, and now with this. Uh, blood glucose monitoring so while the chat gpt was all hype this will become a real deal you know if uh, and with the might of apple behind it both in terms of engineering talent and the balance sheet uh, very well it's uh, you know it, I, it could see the light of the day david says i think there's a similar tech to measure blood pressure Yeah, so I think Apple already does that. So that's that was a, you know, uh, but does market care? No, Apple didn't. In, in Apple didn't talk about AI in this one. If Apple had just all, I mean, this all is done using AI, but if they specifically, you know, dropped a few AI words here and there, maybe the Apple stock would have been up five percent. <laughs> right now, market only cares about AI. All right, another interesting chart, and this is from U.S. Treasury itself, is not by anyone else, but this is from a U.S. Treasury, which talks about the debt, U.S. debt, you know, projected U.S. debt as a percentage of our GDP. So right now we are close to 2020, so maybe 2021, close to maybe 125% of our GDP. But if we continue, if our government continue to spend the way it has been and doesn't look like that, whether it's a red party or a blue party, there is going to be any cut in, uh, you know, no one wants to take that drastic step, which is unpopular step of cutting down the benefits. And if we continue to raise money as a government, situation is really, really bad. guys. And this is not coming from, I mean, this is coming from a government department. I get worried about it for the next generation. I mean, I'll be, won't be around, you know, may not for, for way longer, but uh, if this is the case and with all other geopolitical stuff happening in the world, the dominance of US is not gonna be around for long. Right? It becomes unsustainable. You have like 400% of your GDP is what you owe to the rest of the world. It's like I make 100K in a salary, but my debt is, you know, I have a 400K of a debt. Who would call that as a prudent financial manager, right? So, but this is what our government is. And this is a chart from a U.S. Treasury, which shows that our debt is going to be unsustainable unless we take a very, very drastic measure of cutting the benefits or the other only other option is increase the rates taxes right so roth IRAs. if you have a, a pelated maybe look at a you know again not a financial advice i'm not a financial planner but uh, you know, there are only two ways for government to make money either you only one way to make money but two ways to sustain it is either to increase your revenue or reduce your cost. Reduce your cost means cutting down social security. No one's going to touch that. Cutting down some other benefits. No one is going to touch that. Every year we just come and talk about debt ceiling and keep raising it. That's become a joke. So the only other way for government to, if to avoid this situation, will be to raise taxes. Yeah. No other way. Or maybe your social security, you you know, your withdrawal age will be moved up. Uh, was it, which country was it? France, 
or Germany. I think it was France where they, they increased the retirement age by two years. There have been riots in France. Things will start to happen here as well. I mean, this is, this is like BS, unsustainable. But it is what it is. This is our U.S. government. Uh, coming to U.S. government, this is where Uncle Sam got and spent money in 2022. You know, what, okay, so what surprises you the most in here? The thing that surprised me is this one. This versus this. That's why it makes sense to own business. Uh, here, corporates paid 0.42 trillion, whereas the individuals paid 2.6 trillion in income taxes. Right. So, and uh, tell them, you know, they Amazon's, and, and it's a, uh, I think this is one area where the some of the lawmakers are trying to address it. These big companies get around by paying nothing, whereas an individual income tax, the, the portion of individual income tax in the overall earnings is way, way, it's uh, what, almost seven times more than what the corporates are paying. Uh, final, I think this is the final one. Uh, you notice that Berkshire dumped the TSMC, which is very unlike of Berkshire. But if you're a Berkshire fan, uh, gotta watch out because this is not the first time I'm seeing uh, Berkshire making the decision wherein you buy something and then you sell it off within a year. Uh, the TSMC happened even quicker, right? It, only three months. After three months of buying TSMC, Berkshire actually unloaded most of their positions in TSMC. Right. which is very unlike of how Berkshire Hathaway was managed while Warren and Charlie uh, were, um, you know, running the show. Not that they are not running the show right now, but the second lieutenants are making a lot more decisions. Uh, again, we don't have the details, insider details of was this investing in TSMC, TSMC was that Todd and Ted decision? Uh, they got a two more, um, I mean, uh, under Charlie and, and uh, Warren, there are Todd, Ted Welsher, Todd Welsher. I know them Todd and Ted. Okay, I don't, I don't recall their full names, but those two investment managers have in recent times have done uh, investments that have paid off really well. I think the Apple investment in by Berkshire was also by one of them. You know, if you recall, Charlie and Warren have been have stayed away from tech companies for decades. They never understood how it works. Uh, the only tech investment that Berks that Warren did was IBM, which was disaster. Uh, but then they picked up in I think in 2016 is when they picked or 2017 when they picked up chunk of Apple shares, and I think that was from a recommendation of one of these lieutenants. So yeah, you know what. Warren is 92, Charlie is 99. Uh, God bless them, but uh, you know, bio biology will catch up. They won't be around for longer. So there are other players who are um, coming in and making decisions. And I think that's why some of the decisions which I've seen over the past few years are very unlike of uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, similar decisions were done around the gold. I think they picked up GOLD, Barry Gold, then the sold off, uh, then TSMC, they didn't even hold it for three months. Generally, if Berkshire picks something up, well, like hold for life. Right. So if you've been a long-time Berkshire investor, uh, just understand that there are new players who are making decisions, right? Or if you are a Berkshire follower, you don't own Berkshire shares, but you follow what Berkshire buys, uh, this will come as a shock to you. If you bought TSMC uh, and then Berkshire had boom, sold it off after three months, right? And you may not be that kind of an investor. All right. So what happened after this news came? TSMC was down from like 
102, 105 to 92. Of course, it weakened further down. So we saw, uh, you know, some changes. I see do you mind sharing the source of US Treasury spending chart? Uh, I will find that. I saw it on Twitter. So let me take a note of this one. Hold on. Next week, I'll bring this back. Share the source. Did you read about the undocumented story about getting moved? Food of a uh, 400 day, oh. 300 million annual to house migrants in hotel analysis. No, I'm not. But uh, I don't know why our government is like so screwed up. Our priorities are different. Yeah, the, I, sometimes I just, I, yeah, I, I don't want to be political here, but some of the policies, like spend $300 million uh, on, uh, on uh, undocumented migrants, maybe some illegal migrants, but not giving uh, residency to those who've been around and contributing to our economy for decades and not confirming them. Uh, I mean, this hits really home uh, because I have a lot of my friends in the same boat. Uh, I was a little lucky, um, but I have some friends who've been here for 10, 12, 14 years with the, <clears throat> with the sword of the metals always hanging on their neck that they could may never get their visa renewal and will have to go back. You know, but here we are spending whatever, 30, 300 million dollars. I don't know. This this is something which this is one area where uh, I am one policy which I'm very anti-democrat government. So I can't wrap my head around that. <clears throat> Why the college degree educated, tax paying, uh, job creating individuals. <clears throat> Sorry, let me just sip some water. <clears throat> Um, yeah. Why those individuals can't become a, have to wait for 15, 20 years. And whereas we have a much faster path for, uh, you know, some other section of society. Yeah, I don't want to make it political, but that's, this is one nerve where I have a lot of my own, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of racist. It's not political. I don't want to get into there because I mean it's it's not yeah, kind of racist, well, yeah. irrespect of race. If not, if anyone on let's say people who are coming on H1B visas working in uh, uh you know contributing to this country's economy, paying taxes, creating jobs, are waiting to become you know permanent resident for 15 years. 20, I have some friends who are waiting for like 16 years in this country and they still have to go, <clears throat> I think every six years for their H-1B renewal. Uh, Vivek. And always concerned whether it will be renewed or not. Will they'll be able to enter back or not? I don't understand this. Uh, my, uh, my, um, uh, my cousin and her husband, they're top UC Berkeley uh, uh, um, <clears throat> graduates, uh, you know, <clears throat> grad, uh, PhD and masters, uh, they they were here for over a decade. Yep. So, so it's a yeah. I I can't put th these two together, and this is one area where I'm like, <clears throat> I don't know. Just Does, doesn't make sense to me. Maybe it is it is because it is more personal. I can identify with this problem, while others can't. I personally have been lucky because I came on a different visa, so. I had a much quicker path, but uh, yeah, way more educated people doing way more for this country are still struggling and not sure if they're going to stay here or not. Whereas we have $300 million or a, a lot more, you know, to, to give a quicker path to citizenship to those who have come through an illegal route. And we jokingly do talk about I'm like rather than doing a college degree 
and coming through on H1B visa, you should have just crossed the border, man. There could have been a better, uh, you know, a faster way for you for, for citizenship for you. And again, these are like just jokes. But when we read these news, it's like, this is what the government is telling us. Anyway, let's move Vivek. back to, to the investing side of the house. Vivek, did you get in here on an investor visa? No, I got here on an international manager visa. So my... Uh, uh, you're a genius. I mean, geez. Uh, so... So, so my company, so that's an L1A visa in which if if I choose to apply, I get a permanent residency in a year. So I waited for two, three years in US to see if I want to settle down. My family was okay. And then I applied and I got my green card within a year. But if you come on H1B, like many of my friends have been, they're waiting for 14 years, 15 years. And that's like a ridiculous. They are way more, they make way more money probably than I do and have much better degrees than I do and have contributed a lot more to this country. But uh, oh, Vivek, another thing people go to church to get married. Oh, yeah, I don't want to go, <laughs> get into you know, that one or you know, and then some people will resort to these ideas of let's marry an American, that's a much faster way to citizenship. But anyway, let's get back to this. Uh, that was one, uh, I would say, uh, uh, you know, that that article would touch a, a wrong nerve on my side because I always have very heated discussion when trying, you know, my, both my kids, they are all pro-Democrats. I'm like, all fine, but I don't understand this policy. And I have a heated discussion with my kids always on this one. I'm like, <laughs> we have gone through the process. I see my friends going through the process. It doesn't make sense. Anyway, let's go through our process of uh, analyzing the earnings. Uh, first, we're going to talk about Square. I don't, I should rename this to Block because it's not Square anymore. Right? Square is just one part of their business. So, all right. So I have four earnings for today that will put us to I think we'll just finish it right in time I got which one you want me to go first any speak up or otherwise I'll go Nvidia okay all right let's talk about Nvidia Melee and Nvidia so first we'll go Nvidia then we'll go Melee So stock was up 14% on a day after earnings, right? First thing first. So if you're just looking at watching the stock movements and say, wow, stock is up, great company, must have had great earnings because that's what happens. You know, earnings have, a, if you have a good earning, stock go up. If a bad earnings, when I say earnings means including everything, current earnings, future forecast, blah, blah, blah. You must have thought that's great. But when you dig down and actually read, on their earnings, their quarterly revenue was six billion, down twenty-one percent. Overall, yearly revenue was flat. Right. Uh, let's go here. Okay, quarterly earnings down twenty-one percent. EPS great. Revenue is down. Maybe we cut our cost. Maybe we had a better EPS. EPS was down fifty-two percent. Non-GAAP EPS is down 33%. Overall, yearly revenue is uh, was flat from a year ago. So year to year, no change from a revenue perspective. GAAP earnings is down 55%. I'm like, where does this 14% jump came from? Right? When you look at the numbers and I have a chart below, I'll go back up later. Where does the chart go? Where does the table go? And this is from their own press release. Right. Everything that I look here is how do we get the menu back? Is uh okay. All right. Everything that you look here. Revenue down 21%. Gross margin is bad. Expenses are higher. Operating income is down 58%. Net income is down 53%. EPS is down 52%. And the stock is up 
right? Just doesn't make sense. But it is up because they talked about AI. AI is at inflection point. From startups to major enterprises, we are seeing accelerated interest in the versatility and capabilities of generative AI. All you need to do is to drop some AI. So what NVIDIA did? AI as a service. Right. So let's write what is working. So NVIDIA was, you know, from, uh, from a data crunching to gaming, to crypto, to automotive, uh, now it's an AI. So now we are offering AI as a service. So it basically means customer will be able to engage each layer of NVIDIA AI, the supercomputer, the software acceleration libraries, and the models just as a cloud service. So if I want to run some AI models, I just open my browser, I have an account with the NVIDIA's AI platform and I get everything else. Using their browser, they will be able to engage an NVIDIA DGX AI supercomputer. I don't know what a DGX is, the first time I'm hearing. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, and they say we'll talk about further details later. So overall, uh, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, NVIDIA talked about AI 91 times in their earnings call. And given the current situation in the market where if you talk about AI, you know, that's what markets, NVIDIA is up 14%. Really, I was surprised. Uh, after I read through this report, I'm like, where this 14% coming from? Is it coming from a future guidance? Not much as well. Right. So even the overall year, if you look at a full year one, revenue is almost flat. So they didn't do anything. Uh, gross margin is down. Expenses are high. Even the yearly numbers are bad, right? Not just the quarterly, but all the whole, the yearly numbers are also bad. So <clears throat> outlook, maybe I thought maybe the guidance is good, but the guidance is, you know, 2%. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I don't know. Do, 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 do. This is plus or minus six six point five billion plus or minus two percent. Uh, have they given a first quarter? And uh, they did how much in this quarter revenue? Six six uh, percent. Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't have a Q three. Okay. Yeah, so we look at Q4, Q2, or we don't have a 22. Okay, I don't have that. No. But yeah, <clears throat> so so earlier, they, you know, NVIDIA separates the businesses at this like data center, gaming, visualization. So if we look at this data center, that was the only one which is up 11%. Again, not a huge amount, but just up 11%. Gaming is down 46%. Professional visualization is down 65%. Automotive is the only one which is uh, did better, which is up 135%. So overall, I didn't see why they should be, um, you know, up 14%. Because the core business this quarter wasn't great, but AI, 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 great. Uh, you know, and N NVIDIA is a, Nick, you know, your uh, shovels play. Pick and shovel play for AI. Because you will know, need those shifts, but I think stock is up 60% year to date. Uh, that's the reason why I sold a little bit of a NVIDIA. I still hold it in my portfolio, but the idea is to be aggressive in reducing the cost basis. Um, can this craziness continue? Who possibly? I mean, we we had uh, companies without any product being valued at forty billion dollar at some point of a time. So the markets can be crazy, but um, I'm not rushing. Uh, if you're rushing in to buy Nvidia because after earnings at a fourteen percent, you know, just think about the the overall business. Uh, business wise, it wasn't that great. And AI is future, but you have yet to see how that, you know, does how much that contributes to the revenue. 
They just announced their AI cloud. It's not that everyone is not going to jump onto NVIDIA's AI cloud and start making use of it. So, but I think to, to create a hype, uh, talking about AI is good. So if you look at AI numbers, sorry, NVIDIA and AMD comparing, uh, NVIDIA trades are 53 times the fall, uh, free cash flow, 48 times the EPS. Uh, AMD is like almost half of it. And again, I don't know about the AMD chips, how great are they for the AI workloads? Uh, but again, this is also one of uh, players, right? So these chips are the backbone. These chips are the ones where which will provide the computing power that you will need or the cloud providers will need or let's say the Oracle um, cloud will need or the Google cloud or Azure or Amazon will need to run these uh, AI models. So if you're looking to invest in AI, invest in these uh, picks and shovels, uh, chip companies, I don't know if there are specific software companies. Google is one. Uh, then you have a cloud companies, which will benefit if uh, you know the AI as a service picks up. But I think 60% benefit in a year for NVIDIA. I don't think that's, uh, that's sustainable. So that's on uh, NVIDIA. I didn't find anything good in the results, but for whatever reason, stock seems to have found a lot of good in the AI story. Any suggestions for chip ETF? Uh, the one which I had used in the past is SMH. So let's look at the, and this is the one where a few years ago when I was not looking at individual stocks, uh, but nowadays I, I don't have any Thing in SMH, but uh, let's look at the holdings. Oops. Where's SMH holdings? Top 10% holdings. NVIDIA, ASML, Broadcom, Qualcomm, AMD, Texas. Yeah. So that's uh, that's Nvidia. Sorry, uh, bad business, but the stock did good. So be a little careful on uh, Nvidia side. Uh, right now, lots of lots of hype. Uh, it has it has already, you know, ridden a good amount of a hype. It already was up sixty percent for a year, uh, where it was trading around hundred and. Uh, 40s at the start of a year. So that's uh, conclude NVIDIA. Anything else on NVIDIA before we jump onto the next one, which is uh, Meli. Then we will go to block and then finally close out uh, with Unity software. <clears throat> so Meli, uh, again, this is not a household name <clears throat> because this is not a US, <clears throat> excuse me. One sec. Mercado Libre, it's a, it's a South American based company. Uh, for those who are, are new and have don't know about it, a quick primer on this one. Uh, it's, a, it's got an e-commerce player like Amazon Marketplace, uh, plus it has got its own payment systems like PayPal. Uh, then it also got its own logistics. Uh, Mercado NVOs, and then it's got a financial arm, which is provide credits to the merchants and all that Mercado Credito. So these are the four bigger businesses. Uh, the the more <clears throat> it started with their e-commerce business, which is in uh, you know you see this in yellow color, which is up gross merchandise volume is up 30, uh, 35 percent, right? Their payment business, so overall item sold is up 11% year over year. Payment business, which is in blue, and this is they started with e-commerce, added payment onto it. Uh, 
that's a much bigger growth story over the past few years has been the payment one. And their foray into not just the payment for on the Mercado properties, but also off um, Mercado properties payment. So that continues to, good to see continued traction on it. That's up 80% uh, year over year, the total payment volume. And uh, it's more hard thing to see is the off marketplace uh, means you go to um, a different website, not the Mercado Libre, or you go to a physical retail store, but you're actually paying through Mercado Pago, right? And that's up 121%. And this business has been clocking these like triple digit growth rate for past many quarters. Obviously, it is not sust sustainable. It will slow down. But this does goes to show that Mercado Pago is becoming a standard way of paying uh, on in online as you know whether you are shopping it on Mercado uh, marketplace or not. It's just like this is something which Amazon wanted to pull off, but Amazon Pay really didn't pick up. I mean, we don't use Amazon Pay to pay on Amazon.com, right? Uh, so Amazon really didn't made much headway into the payment side of the house. PayPal has done much better. You know, many other websites, you still go ahead and pay through uh, PayPal. I don't pay through Amazon Pay. I don't think I've ever used Amazon Pay. But of course, I've used PayPal to pay for some stuff on, on other websites. But uh, looks like on Mercado Pago, they've continuously, they're seeing a lot more traction in off-marketplace. Right? So overall revenue for this quarter, so though the... GMV is the total number of goods that were transacted on their marketplace, the total value. Uh, revenue is what the revenue for Mercado Libre, uh, that is up 56%. And mind you, all these numbers are foreign exchange, uh, uh, you know, neutral numbers. So at a constant currency numbers. So the headwinds of the US dollar being stronger has not been accounted in this one. I'll have to find out what those numbers are though. But anyway, those are accounting numbers because it doesn't really reflect the true performance of the business or operational performance of the business. Uh, for that, the, we have to take out the currency impact, which is what these numbers are. Okay, what else? Uh, the NVOs, which is their logistics business, that was up 417 basis points. Uh, a credit portfolio is 2.8 billion, up 68% year over year. And uh, income from operations is 11.6%. So at a summary for a year, at a summary level for the full year, 100 billion in total payments volume is a run rate, $10 billion of revenue, 1 billion item shipped, and $1 billion of EBIT in 2022, all for the first time. So from a business side, this continues to chug along. Uh, I don't think anything which is, um, you know, cause me any concern on, on the business side of the house. So on the commerce performed well, I mean, we looked at these numbers already. Um, now let's look at some of the other uh, metrics and total number of unique buyers is been growing steadily. Now it is 46 million. There were 46 million unique buyers and uh, around seven items on an average per unique buyer. Logistics, which is their NVOs platform, uh, 31 million items were shipped through uh, Mercado NVOs, taking the total above 1 billion items for the first time in their history. Again, net managed network penetration reached almost 94% within Mexico, Chile, and Colombia. Uh, that means 94% of the goods are shipped through their network. And almost 76% of the orders were delivered within 48 hours. Okay. So within 48 hours, you have a 76% of the orders same day and the next day is 51%. Right? So that's on their network side. Now looking at the payments business, because this is their going to be next growth engine, right? eBay, PayPal story. 
So PayPal got valued way higher than eBay, payment growth story. Uh, so I want to look at what, how they are doing on payments. Is uh, So payments, they grew 61% year over year. A digital account, which is, uh, so they have a, oh, let me just look at it. Uh, year over year, 80% uh, growth in payments, which is includes acquiring a digital account keep total payment volume. So acquiring TPV, which is on their platform online, so you know Mercado's website, their off platform, uh, their point of sales, QR code transactions. Again, this is <clears throat> very different from how some of the things happen in the US. In the US, I can't pay through PayPal on the on a retail store point of sale. Or maybe if but Mercado Pago, not only you can pay it online, but also they have a point of sale terminals available at retails uh, with which you can pay through their payment platform, right? So it could become a much bigger financial services company if this starts to become way bigger and bigger, right? This and the next one, which is their credit portfolio. So yeah, and the digital account, which is their wallet payments, P2P transfer between just like a cash app, that grew 140%. Right? So payments is still okay. Um, what else we see? There are QR payments, uh, had another triple digit growth, 121%, which is their, uh, you know, off marketplace. On marketplace grew 44%, which is now they have almost 100% is their, uh, you know, uh, penetration rate. Means close to 100% of the sales, uh, they are using uh, uh, Mercado Pago to pay on their own properties. Uh, lastly, look at their credit portfolio stuff. Um, I So last week, not last week, last quarter, uh, we looked at, when we were looking at Mercado Libre, oh, no, was it this company? No, no. Hold on, just give me a moment. I'm getting confused on which one was that. There are two or three companies, these companies who are in a similar business. Was it Mercado Libre, which had a, which I said, I'm a little concerned that they are, they have a bad loans. Hold on, hold on. This is this quarter. With, uh, last quarter. Yes. Oh, okay. I think it was Mercado Libre. Keep an eye on the past due loan amount had increased a lot. Bad debts have increased uh, on Mercado Credito. So, okay. So this year, they were able to get better interest margin of losses after losses from 37% to 48%, uh, percent, which means they were able to uh, manage the quality uh, of their credit better. Uh, looking into this one, what they did was uh, do, 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 do. the portfolio and originations were stable with a decline in origination, which was off in Brazil, but growth in Mexico and Argentina. Interest margin after losses spread rose to 48.3%, driven by adjustments in our APRs and lower new provisioning in Q3 2022 as a result of lower risk and better asset quality. I think the, so this is the concern which I had was something that we need to watch out for as an investor is uh, after the Q, yeah, in uh, December, uh, um, that keep an eye on the past due loan amount and the bad debts. So it looks like they did take an action uh, and reduced how much amount of, uh, uh, you know, new accounts they signed, but focus more on the, reducing the risk and the better quality borrowers or better quality merchants. So which resulted in net interest margin uh, after accounting for losses to be higher from 30, sorry, to, to jump from 32% in Q4 of 21 to 48% Q4 of uh, 22. So that concern is 
kind of a little is being addressed. But this is one area where we may still want to watch out in terms of the bad loans. What I like most about this company, and I think every company should give this as an investor, is a one quick summary. Right? Again, I'm not going to read through this, but this is like a, a, for a pilot, this is a cockpit which can tell us everything that's happening with this company. Right? On the marketplace, GMV, items sold, live listings, logistics, their payment business, and their portfolio, you know, all your revenue number percentage increase. Users number, p &L numbers, and then their country level numbers. Like Apple, some of these companies, like Apple is notorious for not giving any information. So as an investor, you have to do a lot of work if you want to analyze Apple earnings. But I like this one because, hey, they, they have been always transparent. And, uh, uh, you know, I still hold it uh, in my portfolio. Now, the only concern, not concern, but I think that we need to watch out for is this is not a very well-known ticker. Not that CNBC always talks about Mercado Libre or Mali. They, In general, I think they never talk about it. They never cover their earning. So the volume in this is low. It's not a highly traded ticker. So if you look at a Mali, there will be a hundred, a few hundred thousands, or close to just a million. Right? So it's not really heavily traded ticker. Number two is uh, the beta spread is very wide. So it's difficult to manage if you're doing an option trade, right? So like I'll do a call spread for, you know, reducing the, okay, this is the margin, which is iron condor, which I have in progress. But uh, so if I have iron condor, you know, I've sold a put spread on it at 1050 and uh, 1024. To five, and then a wider on the call side just to collect premium. But if stock goes up or down, make a wild move, trying to adjust it is a pain in your back because the wide, the bid ask spread is so wide and the volume is low. But I like the business, so I'm still holding this stock in my portfolio. Though doing the standard cost basis reduction is difficult, a little difficult in this one. Third thing to watch out for, it is still an emerging market. So it could be volatile and uh, could be, a, you know, given the stuff that could happen with Colombia or, you know, some of these, uh, it's got a big exposure in Argentina. So which had already gone through one crisis earlier. So that sovereign risk is also there. Uh, lastly is, of course, when every crypto was all the rage. They also got into crypto exchange, uh, but right now no one talks about it because right now crypto is a bad name. If you talk about crypto, your stock will go down. If you talk about AI, stock goes up. That's uh, that's how the things have changed in a year. So, but I think these, I do have the the day-to-day -day concern or, you know, month-to-month -month concern is this, uh, reducing cost basis in this is, is, is a challenge because the options are not that tight uh, in, in Mercado Libre. Okay, so that was on Mercado Libre. Uh, everything all good. Um, and stock didn't do much, looks like, right? Well, stock was up only 2%. But that's being up from 800 over here. So from a year to date, it is still up. Uh, Meli is up 36% year to date. All right, let's move on to the next one block. Uh, okay, we just hit our 12 marks. So if you want to drop off, uh, feel free. You're not obliged. I mean, you're not obliged to even join this one. So I'm really thankful that you actually joined this. But if you want to drop off, uh, uh, please do. Uh, I won't mind that. I will just quickly cover through the block square and also uh, unity. And then we'll you know wrap it up, call it a day. All right, let's talk about the, the block, formerly known as square, changed the name to block because the CEO is all into uh, is very big proponent of uh, cryptos. And once they made their foray into crypto, 
um, he also changed the company branding. Okay, <clears throat> and of course, the other thing is there are a lot of uh, other businesses which became a big businesses. And uh, so calling it a square, which is mostly tied to their uh, dongle, uh, which was only one part of business, it doesn't really reflect what this company does. But I don't know why they chose the name block, could have chosen anything else. In any case, so this is their earnings, their gross profit. And again, now they will never mention the revenue. I don't know why. Some companies will mention the revenue, but uh, Square or Block, they don't mention the revenue in their charts. So for that, we'll have to go further down. In any case, the gross profit is up 40% to $1.66 billion. Our net income is basically loss of close to $115 million. Now, if you really look at it, they got two big businesses. One is the Square, which is what their early name was, the name of the company was, but then their cash app also started growing and became much bigger and bigger business. So that's why now they call it as Block. And of course, then they have other business, uh, which is a title, uh, the music streaming service that they bought from Jay-Z. So Square gross profit is up 22% to $800 million. Uh, cash app is up 64%. That's a huge. So cash app is now becoming big. And cash app is more as a peer-to-peer -peer payments uh, and you know uh, for paying, uh, for buying stocks, for buying. Uh, this, this is like a competitor to PayPal for buying crypto. Uh, this is for retail users. And Square is for merchants. So they have a merchant solution in Square, consumer solution in Cash App. All right, financial metrics looking at gross profit for the full year is close to $6 billion, which is up 36%, but almost half a billion of losses. And uh, yeah, $3 billion from coming from Square, $2.95 billion coming from uh, Cash App. What I also want to look at is the BNPL, right? Which came, uh, which they also are owner of uh, Afterpay, which is the BNPL solution, which they acquired in, I guess, in 2021. Uh, that was one reason I'm like, what the heck are you guys doing? Uh, and uh, well, that, that was one thing which I didn't like it. And now if you look at the gross profit, uh, excluding their uh, BNPL platform. Um, sorry, uh, oh, there we go. So uh, block, uh, I mean, it doesn't make sense. So, so we'll talk about that later. I have some concerns on the BNPL. It has contributed a lot to the revenue and to the gross profit, but it's been losing money. So from when it comes to net income, there's a huge negative impact of the BNPL. Uh, Cash App card, which is, I do want to talk about is uh, the, the Cash App card has been very strong over the past year, $750 million in gross profit, up 56% a year over year from the transaction on the card. So now, so the Cash App, they also have a card which contributes to 26% of the overall profit of the cash app. So this is like a becoming, really look at it, uh, it's like becoming a financial services, a bank company. Find uh, you, Square already has a banking license. They got their banking license in 2019 or 2020, right? And now they have a, pro they are creating these uh, card app products. I think their title is Marketa for this product. But now they have these uh, products of, you know, your debit cards or credit cards. And now they also launched a new savings product, which allows customers to budget by putting a balance in their, you know, uh, keep in, within the cash app, move to your savings account. Kind of. So they're adding these services just like a bank would be. Uh, and uh, so this whole cash app itself could become a big kind of a banking platform. That's what they're focused on. All right, what I want to look at here is, uh, this is there from, from a Bitcoin. Uh, again, one of the other so-called businesses from their crypto is their Bitcoin business. 
again, this is more, lot more on a revenue side, but nothing much from a overall uh, uh, when it comes to the profit, because they the amount of uh, cut that they get is small. So well, uh, other thing, what the, I think this is again coming from a pressure from a uh, lot of investors is earlier they were focused on rule of 40. I mean, now they change the definition of how, what they consider as a rule of 40 is they're looking at gross profit growth plus adjusted operating income margin, um, which will now consider the stock-based compensation. So earlier, the impact of stock-based compensation was not reflected. And then, you know, you can keep on paying a lot more through under the SBC and uh, show a better your rule of 40. But now they said uh, they pivoted on, looks like maybe from active shareholders is, hey, <clears throat> we want to now make sure we consider the impact of stock-based compensation when we are valuing and evaluating ourselves on how good are we doing against rule of 40. Now this rule of 40, and when I read through this, real, now I realize this is not a very standard, the term is standard, the definitions are different. Um, some companies where I looked at rule of 40 was your revenue growth uh, plus your profit margin, right? Net income margin. The total should be more than 40. This is where one of my previous companies used to do. Then I was, you know, some other investors they look at, and which I saw a lot more being used in university was your revenue growth plus free cash flow margin. And I've been doing that for almost now 18 months. When I talk about rule of 40, I look at what's your revenue growth plus your free cash flow margin. If your revenue is growing, you are growing at 30, you're growing at 60%, but there are free cash flow, you're not generating any free cash flow, you're okay to have that as negative 20% because the sum is 40. When I was reading through the growth, this square one, I'm like, they have a completely different one. They are now they look at their gross profit percent plus your adjusting operating income uh, percent, which is different. So it looks like there is no standard around rule of 40. And I think VCs, they have a different way of uh, looking at rule of 40. But anyway, <clears throat> the way uh, Square used to calculate, are they going to make a change in those metrics, which is more shareholder friendly? Because now market is putting more emphasis on the gap profits. And uh, so it means you have to account for uh, stock-based uh, compensation. Right? So <clears throat> There are goods and the bads in this in this report, and someone in the Twitter did a much better job of uh, showing us the goods and the bads, right? So they don't show revenue, but you really and there is a reason <clears throat> why the revenue doesn't make sense because when you accounting perspective, if you have to include revenue, you have to show up, you know, the revenue accrued through the Bitcoin transactions, you know, Bitcoins bought and sold, but uh, there is hardly any money coming out from that. So if you look at this revenue, they actually made less, it actually declined. It is almost flat to decline, right? And the reason is when I look at this, and the reason why the revenue was flat to a little bit decline is because uh, of uh, this Bitcoin, right? So last year, there was a $10 billion of revenue, which is, Hey, if you are buying a Bitcoin on your own cash app, you're paying $23,000. I think that's where Bitcoin is. So that's $23,000 is revenue. But that doesn't stay you know, with them because cash, oh, sorry, square, cash app buys Bitcoin. And then only they, the, the only, the, they only make a difference of you know, the, the, the fee that they earn. So that revenue is down 3%. So if we really want to look at a revenue, we should look at the revenue excluding Bitcoin and then evaluate the company, right? Okay. Other thing, operating expenses are all high. 54% higher in the product development, sales and marketing uh, up 21%, 72% is their G&A as compared to their uh, previous 
um, uh, here. And now, again, this is because, could be because of stock-based compensation, we'll have to see. But nonetheless, the operate, the expenses are really high. And that's why we had a huge operating loss in uh, 2022. Okay. So, so overall net income is a loss of half a billion dollar, right? And, and the reason why it's high is because of also the stock-based compensation has increased by a lot. If you look at uh, stock-based compensation, that has increased from $608 million to more than a billion dollar which is what 60, 80%, whatever increase in the stock-based compensation. So that's caused a big dip in their revenue. Um, even though from a, yeah. So I think that that's, uh, again, one more area to watch out for is the stock-based compensation. Market liked it because I think the numbers were better than expected. But I think I'm still going to be a little cautious on this one. Good to see that their cash app has is growing um, at a much faster pace, and you know that's a business which will probably add a lot more to to Square Story in in future. And of course, if Bitcoin transactions start to grow probably they'll make a little more revenue on this one. But overall, not a stellar report, not a, you know, blow out of the park uh, kind of a report, but uh, a decent one. Uh, but you have to dig deeper to see uh, the stock-based compensation is, is really killing them. What I didn't see is, did they take any impairment charges on afterpay? So hold on. Let's, uh, let's bring up their... Uh, shareholder letter any impairment charges have they taken balance sheet and that's what 21 or 27 billion dollar setting money on fire gosh okay let's see Where's the balance? There we go. So they still have eleven billion dollar of uh, goodwill, and I think most of this either could be on through Tidal, which I guess probably a smaller one because Tidal was not that big a uh, wasn't that big acquisition. But I think this is all coming from Afterpay. But I'm not sure if this is, they did an impairment charge or. A Bitcoin is fine. That's more accounting. Uh, no goodwill impairment. No. Okay. So maybe I think they're still. Yeah. So. So no, okay. We'll see. But I, I think if after pay BNPL doesn't really work out, they may have to take uh, some goodwill write down, and that should all will also impact their overall, uh, you know, the the P and L whenever they take the write down. So that was a block. In the last one, let's quickly wrap that up, and we'll then have a. Uh, Unity. Uh, Unity is a software company that provides platform for building games, building, uh, uh, you know, 3D models, or I would say more immersive 3D experience, not just the models, but more immersive 3D experience, um, opportunities in metaverse, opportunities in, uh, in um, filming, opportunities in creating games and all that stuff. So overall, $451 million revenue increase of 43% year over year, but they had acquired a company called Iron Source. Now that acquisition result is also showing up in this one. So uh, I think there is some chart which says if, or probably there, I didn't see 
break up of if they are not include iron source how the rest of the business is doing but anyway that's now water under the bridge because iron source is now part of the company so we'll have to show that as a overall part of the company anyway so um overall yeah 451 million which grew 43 percent for the year the overall growth is 25 percent to one point close to 1.4 billion dollar of revenue uh, what I liked here was uh, some of the customer success uh, and more importantly is their tools were used for two movies, both of movies I liked is Avatar and Black Panther of Wakanda Forever. So like they provide uh, these tools for creators, game creators, movie creators, uh, and these tools were also used in uh, in these two movies. Margins are horrific. Uh, from a uh, gross margin, it's, you know, operating margins only 2.9%. Net margin is so down, uh, down like 64%. Uh, <clears throat> now looking at their businesses, there were two businesses. One is a create solution, which allows uh, developers to create the games. And then the other is called uh, operate solutions. Used to call it as operate solutions. Now they call it as a uh, grow. And uh, uh, we'll look at these two businesses. So also in this quarter, they made a change in how they report these segments or what get reported under these two segments. So now they're sharing. Uh, this is a good thing that they're sharing what it would be without that, you know, in a previous reporting structure, what it would be with a new reporting structure. So in a new reporting structure, you know, they moved some of the some of the businesses from either from under operate onto the create or the, one of the business which was a standalone business was a strategy partnerships. Now they moved it under uh, uh, under which one the gaming which are previously put it under operate and strategy partnership separately. Oh yeah, so they moved the gaming as strategic partnership under create solution so there has been some a uh, crisscrossing of uh, of the segments that have happened uh, in this year uh, overall without that it would have been 55% with that 41% uh, this change happened because they bought iron source i think uh, still okay what i didn't like it they also bought back 42.7 million shares generally it is a shareholder friendly uh, move but I believe this was an eye wash and a bad decision. Number one, they bought it at a higher price. And number two, they also issued a lot more stock because the iron source acquisition was completed and probably they paid a lot of those employees through a stock. And so I think this whole buying back is just an eye wash. Really doesn't help. As a, To me as an investor, it really doesn't help that you bought back 42 million shares, but you end up issuing a lot more over there, right? So overall, we may want to look at what's the net outstanding fully diluted share count is, right? That will take into account all your ESOPs, your stock options, and also what you buy, bought back. But what I liked is uh, the increase in the number of their customers, which are paying more than 100K, and their uh, net dollar expansion rate. Uh, ticked up from 111% to 116%. Right? Uh, and overall guidance is given around 48% year over year, right? So I think the market didn't like their guidance because from their quarter perspective, things were not as bad that the market should punish them with a 16% down. But the guidance was pretty lame. Uh, from market perspective. I think market was expecting way higher. They were expecting for $525 million of guidance. All they got was on a higher side, $480 million. So the stock is down 16%. Okay. Uh, concern, stock-based compensation is huge. And I think this is what uh, would have contributed to this whole big net loss is in this uh, in this quarter, the previous quarter, I think they completed the iron source acquisition, and there's almost five or six, what forty percent increase in stock based compensation. Now this is where you look at the fully diluted shares outstanding, even though they have 
In the earnings, they'll tout about, hey, we are buying back the shares. But who cares? The overall share count has increased from 345 million to uh, 493 million. So do I care whether you bought back like 40 million shares? No way. That's just what well, that was just an eyewash, right? So uh, from a stock, per their operations perspective, revenue of 43%, but the cost is up 90%. Right? Uh, total operating expenses is up 51%. And losses are up 90%. Again, these are accounting. So it does include your uh, stock-based compensation, which I hope is the one-time increase in the stock-based compensation for the culmination of, uh, of the iron source deal and should taper down. But that's something that we need to keep an eye on. Uh, so that's on a unity. Um, I still hold unity in my portfolio, but I'm kind of a neutral to bearish right now. So the idea is to uh, be a little more aggressive in reducing the cost basis. There is a need and the demand for this, um, for this kind of a business. And what I'm more excited about the growth in their non-gaming business, which is working with the movie studios, working with the city governments, working with other commercial companies to develop, uh, a, you know, let's say a twin digital model of, let's say a tax, and I don't know whether Tesla is a customer or not, but just taking an example, a develop a twin digital replica of, let's say, a factory, right? Or a twin digital replica of a turbine, then that replica could be used for giving training and all that stuff, right? So, so from that perspective, because they're very strong on doing this immersive 3D rendering, from that perspective, yeah. There is a growth, but it's going to be all in future. And uh, Unity was the first one, but let's see how strong they continue to be. Gaming, they are pretty strong, but uh, that business is only has a limited growth. So we'll have to see how the other part of their business is grow. And now they're also getting competition from Palantir in that one. So not, not, not going to rush out and buy the stock because now the stock is cheaper. Uh, I think it's cheaper for a reason. So I we'll want to wait and watch on uh, Unity. So that's all on uh, on the Unity side. They didn't talk about the the change in the their uh, AI, AI model that was fed wrong data three or four quarters ago, and probably they have corrected that because I didn't see any mention of that one. So that's all is. Uh, this is unity. And with that, let's uh, we are end of our session. Sorry, ran almost 25 minutes over. Any other thing, any other questions, any other thoughts, uh, anything else? Uh, Vivek, you're super. Don't worry about it. I don't worry. You're, you're welcome. And thanks for the kind words. You're very generous. Cool. All right, then let's uh, call it a day here. I am hungry. I'm going to go out and to get something to eat. All right, uh, so then we'll talk again uh, next week. So next week, I will also talk about uh, stock repair uh, strategy. That's an option strategy. So we'll, we'll go and see how some of the option, uh, you know, Gurus, uh, investor, they use stock repair strategy in which you are holding a stock and uh, it has gone down. How you can use some of those strategy to reduce your cost basis or maybe, you know, if stock gets sold off, well, higher than where it currently trades. So we'll talk about that uh, next week. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. You guys have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.